Good morning, good afternoon, good day, wherever you are on the global planet and the digital world. My name is Charles X. White. I'm your host for Community Views and Solutions. Also, uh, we are part, this is part of a series that we're having. It's called Scholars, Scientists, and Practitioners. And yes, we include the broad community as the embodiment of what the, what's in the practitioner's bag of medicine. So today we are excited to have a guest that's representing one of the foremost scholars and medical doctors in the, the field of medicine, uh, Dr. Peter McCullough. Uh, he has some other uh, business he had to do attend uh, unexpectedly today, but he has a co-author that we are joined with today, Mr. John Leake, who is a co-author of a book titled The Courage to Face COVID-19. He's going to, today's discussion has to do with what is he finding? Dr. McCullough has been on the front edge. He made the edge of what should be said about COVID and how to say it uh, based on empirical data, his research. Mr. Leake is going to give us a little profile on that. And we're going to talk kind of freestyle. We're going to talk about COVID in America, COVID uh, in marginalized communities, vulnerable populations. We're going to talk about different aspects of COVID. We want him to introduce himself uh, before we get started to let you know what his background is. But, uh, of course, if he's referred by Dr. McCullough, he's at the top of the shelf. So, Mr. Link, how you doing this morning? I mean, this afternoon or today? I'm, I'm fine, Charles. Thanks, thanks for having me. I love your old school Southern accent. Where'd you grow up? <laughs> I grew up in Houston, Texas. Well, it, 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 it sounds almost a little east, but anyway, I, it, it's a pleasure to be here North with you. Northeast. <laughs> um, it's fun to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Dr. McCullough uh, got suddenly, I mean, and I can, I can testify to this, like the last second a lawyer dragged him into a big litigation up in, in Delaware. He had to get on a plane at the last second. Um, so um, Dr. McCall and I wrote a book together. We started working on it, researching it um, just over a year ago. We both live in Dallas, Texas. He obviously is a practicing cardiologist, internist, and medical researcher. I am a true crime author. And um, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, when we first heard these reports of SARS-CoV-2, this emerging virus, apparently, as we were told, coming out of China. Um, there were things that were being told from our public health authorities in Washington that just didn't seem very plausible to me. Um, we can go into that. Um, I, based on my interpretive framework as a true crime author, perceived that there were elements of fraud. Um, what we were being told had, seemed to be uh, fraudulent misrepresentation of the problem, and then some of the solutions or, or purported solutions that were offered um, made no sense to me whatsoever. I knew I needed a top medical and scientific authority to work with to help me to interpret a lot of this. Um, and as Providence would have it, um, Dr. McCullough also lives in Dallas, just about two miles from my family home. So I contacted him just over a year ago and we started working on a book and um, it's just now come out, The Courage to Face COVID-19, prevent Preventing Hospitalization and Death While Battling the Biopharmaceutical Complex. And so anyway, that's kind of what we're hoping to talk about. Um, again, my apologies, Dr. McCullough couldn't attend. 
Well, you you open up with a with a fastball. What yes, is sir. a true crime author? And of course, in the black community, we always look for the crime when we ever, whenever these things happen. But from your take, which is very, very interesting, you, you, you sought out a medical expert to give you some data that supports some fraud or something, or something of that sort? Well, I mean, okay, so if you think of kind of a conventional crime, what we see in the movies or on television, so let's say there's a serial killer who's running around Houston murdering, I mean, God forbid, but let's say that this were to happen. And so my job as an author is, you know, figure out what's going on. It may require, probably will require talking with the police, with the prosecutor's office, figure out what's going on, figure out who are the characters, who is the perpetrator. And as a book author, to tell this story in the form of a narrative um, that is interesting and compelling and, and reveals the truth of the crime. Well, with this pandemic response, starting you know straight out of the gate in, in March of 2020, I began to think that this isn't a conventional true crime story. It's not some maniac running around town killing women or something. It is a highly organized crime. I mean, I would compare it, I mean, the easiest comparison is to the mafia. Um, but the mafia in this case is what we call the, the biopharmaceutical complex. It's guys who have gotten into the business of pandemic response. And what these guys have discovered is that there's a tremendous amount of money, trillions of dollars of money, if you can present yourself as having the solution to the pandemic and the politicians of the world will perceive you to be an authority to listen to you with your solution and to then buy your product. <laughs> so in this case, the solution to the pandemic that was presented to the public was we all have to stay at home, you know, stay home, stay safe, and wait for the vaccine that is being developed. And the moment that vaccine is available and every man, woman, and earth on man, woman, and child on earth gets the vaccine, then life can go back to normal. And what I began to perceive was that this just isn't true. Um, the vaccine that was developed wasn't the solution. Um, our economy and our entire people should not have been locked up. Our businesses should not have been shut down. Schools should not have been shut down. Churches shouldn't have been shut down. That the whole pandemic response was based on fraudulent misrepresentations. I mean, it's a big, it's the biggest fraud that's ever been committed in the entire history of humanity. Well, let me ask you this, uh, with that last statement, what is it gonna be fair to say that the pandemic was a global catastrophe? Well, I mean, SARS-CoV-2 is a real virus. It does present a threat to certain high risk groups in the population. These groups were fairly easy to identify from the beginning, um, namely people who suffer from certain underlying illnesses or comorbidities. Um, diabetes um, is a high risk factor, high blood pressure, um, morbid obesity, and then um, the greatest risk factor of all is just old age. 
people over the age, excuse me, uh -huh. people over the age of, of, of 70 and particularly people over the age of 80 were at a particular risk of severe illness. Um, pardon me. Um, and um, it was these groups to whom the disease posed a real risk that the pandemic response should have been directed. Um, and one of the things that Dr. McCullough and I talk about in our book is he and his colleagues all over the world, the guys who were trying to do something to help their patients, they quickly discovered that there are certain repurposed drugs and supplements that had long been available, had long been used in the practice of medicine that could be repurposed. That is, you have a drug that is being used to treat something else like rheumatoid arthritis or blood clotting or pulmonary inflammation. Those drugs, we already know about them. They've already been used for many, many years. They have an established safety profile. What Dr. McCullough and his colleagues realized is that for this high risk group in the, in the public, we can use these repurposed drugs to prevent them from getting really sick. We could prevent them from falling so ill that they would have to be admitted to hospital where they might very well die. And what we've discovered as we got into all of this is that these repurposed drugs, instead of being supported and, and distributed by our government, they were suppressed. They were made inaccessible. Pharmacists were not allowed to dispense them. Doctors were not allowed to prescribe them. So this is another element of crime that we describe in our book, the suppression of early treatment. What's, what's, the, uh, what's the name of the book? The Courage to Face COVID-19, Preventing Hospitalization and Death, while battling the biopharmaceutical complex. So in, in this particular book that took a format of crime to solve the media or the popular version of what the treatment could be, you, you took a, a situation analyzed it under a crime microscope and the and you and in the book you have your findings yes sir i mean that's that's exactly how i would describe it i approach this with dr mccullough serving as an expert to guide me in the in my interpretation of the facts remember medicine is complex it's a complex field of knowledge it requires a lot of education and training I'm not a, a, a trained physician myself, so I needed Dr. McCullough to help me conduct my investigation. But my investigation is, is the investigation of, of, you know, I'm, I'm investigating criminal conduct. So I hope your audience will understand that, that my book, which I co-authored with Dr. Peter McCullough, it is a true crime story. It's not just a, a medical guide. Um, it, it, we, we show, you know, what has happened, what is the crime that was committed, and who are the perpetrators? Well, now, let me ask you this. Um, are, you, are you, so when people say that's another consp uh, conspiracy theory, what's the response for that? Well, all of the facts that we present in our book are clearly documented and cited. <clears throat> the readers can look at the relevant documents and video footage and statements of these <clears throat> different participants and see for themselves. We don't, we don't present any, any um, hypothesis or theory we present the facts of the matter, which are very easy to ascertain. I mean, that's the strange thing about this story is that, <clears throat> excuse me, all of this is out in the open. 
Just because the mainstream media doesn't report these things, these incidents, these actions, these, these acts of fraud, it doesn't mean they're not happening. And a big part of the story is that the mainstream media, the corporate legacy media, is part of this organized criminal behavior. The media um, is now taking its marching orders from the corporate interests who have committed the crime. Mm. The newsrooms are just receiving a script from their international foundation donors, from the pharmaceutical companies that do the advertising and give them their advertising revenue. They're just soldiers doing their participation in this, in this action. They're not reporting the news anymore. They're not reporting factual reality. So, so it, the, the media played a key role in this. I mean, not, not the entire media, not the independent media, but the mainstream corporate media, CNN, um, the networks, I mean, they all participated in this. So if, when you said something about comorbidities. Yes, sir. Now, if we extract that out just a little bit and we look at those two ethnic groups, black and Hispanic, that are high in those cold areas, is that a, uh, is that an indication of where a lot of resources should have gone immediately? I um, interviewed for my research um, a number of people from the Hispanic community um, because <clears throat> these were patients of one of the doctors who I worked with. She, a doctor, Yvette Lozano in Dallas, who is an advocate of early treatment, it just so happened that a lot of the people who came to her clinic seeking her care were Hispanic. Um, and because I kn knew and trusted her, um, it was um, a, a very readily available resource. So this is what would happen within the, Span the his Hispanic community, which we document in our book. So you're a 54-year-old Spanish male. Um, you are, by your own admission, overweight, um, maybe 50, 60 pounds overweight, and you have high untreated blood sugar. So if you are roughly have that health profile, um, then the proper response, if you get a positive test, is not to say, um, Mr. Rodriguez, you are tested positive COVID, stay at home, isolate, and if you get really, really sick, then go to hospital. So that was the official standard of care. There's nothing we can do for you to help you. Go home, there are no treatments. This is what our official public health agencies in Washington, this was the official policy. Go home. There's nothing that can be done for you. If you get really sick, then go to hospital. And sorry, you know, at hospital, you may very well just get sick, really sick, be put on a ventilator and die. That was the official standard of care policy. And Dr. McCullough's recommendation was? Dr. McCullough would say, due to this man's age, Due to his high blood sugar and due to the fact that he's overweight, he is at an elevated risk of severe COVID illness. He could get severe pulmonary inflammation where he can't breathe. He could get severe blood clotting where there are clots in the lungs that present the air from transferring through the lungs. We need to aggressively start treating this man before he gets really sick to prevent him 
from getting really sick and going to hospital. And so there were certain combinations of drugs that could help to prevent a man in this high risk category from going to the hospital. But our official policy did not support this. In fact, the official policy was to forbid this, to, to make it, the medical boards would, would actually say, you can't treat this patient with these drugs, even though the drugs have long been FDA approved for other illnesses. So it's just completely crazy. And I interview several patients who, who did get early treatment. I mean, they, it wasn't easy. They, they had to go through great hardship and inconvenience, but they did get early treatment and it helped them. I mean, I have multiple testimonials of people in that high risk category who started receiving early treatment and started feeling better the next day. So it's not only they didn't go to hospital, it was 24 hours after I started early treatment, I started to feel better. It was easier for me to breathe. Um, I, you know, I, I, I just generally felt like I wasn't dying anymore. Um, so um, I think that our, our, some of our disadvantaged communities um, not not every single member of the community, but statistically on average, tended to be people with less access to resources. You mentioned the Hispanic and the African American. I think they paid a really, really heavy price in this because our public health agencies had implemented these terrible policies. Now, if I remember correctly, in one of Dr. Uh, McCullough's interviews, he mentioned that some people unnecessarily died because they didn't have that prescription or extra step on these uh, accepted uh, uh, pharmaceutical and, 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 and how they were taken uh, for certain other ailments, but they were stopped. You, uh, they were, the doctors were told or the pharmacists were told they cannot prescribe these uh, medicines. Yes, Dr. McCullough, um, he's done a lot of analysis on this. He, he believes that if these early treatment regimens <clears throat> that were developed by Dr. McCullough and, and his colleagues um, there was a learning curve. It wasn't straight out of the gate. Um, they understood perfectly how to treat this thing. It was something that, you know, when you have an emergency and you've never confronted it before, I mean, you, you, this is a, there's an element of learning. Um, so Dr. McCullough and his colleagues, they, they started to share information, to study, to, to communicate with each other. And they realized, okay, you know, we can take the edge off of this illness to prevent hospitalization. You know, by the time you get to the fall of 2020, his conclusion is that by then there was sufficient data, there was sufficient observational and even trial data to justify making these early treatments the standard of, of, of care for the entire country. And had our government agencies adopted these early treatments as the standard of care, he believes ultimately somewhere between 600 and 800,000 lives could have been saved and millions of hospitalizations could have been prevented. So let me ask this. In your research, you, you, you talk directly to some patients of a doctor that, was, that you were familiar with and you yes, trusted sir. her and all of that. And one of the examples you gave was this particular Hispanic guy was a, had di uh, diabetes or was a likely candidate, so on and so on. So if we look at what the existing 
pool of data is about health indicators and what groups are in high risk for all of those categories. And the black community may be this year and the Hispanic community next year, but it's a trade off who's first, who's second in the highest risk factors. So it's easy to, to transpose that particular research, even though you didn't get to some of the people in the black community, but since they statistically fit in the category, we would be statistically at risk, at a higher risk, and would uh, deserve, based on the data, uh, attention and, and treatment. Now, I'm making an analogy from the, from the disaster standpoint, because that's where my, my, my bed is made, in the disaster re recovery and preparedness. So in that particular area, the communities that are most at risk are least served. That, that is correct. And, and there, there are a number of, of factors that come in, into play. I mean, um, one thing that, you, that I think is worth considering is, is that people all over the world, it's not necessarily a racial category or an ethnic category, but any place in the world in, in which you have people living in, a, in, a, in an urban setting. So I think of South Dallas. Um, I'm, I'm here in Dallas. And if you, if you go south of the Trinity River, for example, you have communities that are composed predominantly of African-Americans. And a lot of them are living, there are multiple generations that are living in the same house. So you, that, to me, that's comparable to, for example, Southern Italy, where it's not uncommon in Southern Italy for grandmother, grandparents, parents, and children to all be living in the same home. So you think about how backwards these policies was, were, where we were all told to stay at home. So you have an entire multi-generational family who has all been told to stay at home in close quarters. Oftentimes people of lower income, they don't live in huge houses. They, they might live in just a small home. So you have multiple people, multiple generations living in the same home, but somebody's gotta go out and buy the groceries. Somebody has to go to work. And if you're in the Mexican and the Hispanic or the African-American community, you might be a so-called essential worker where you're a truck driver or you work at a grocery store or, or wherever. So you imagine a scenario in which someone brings COVID home to a small house with multiple generations living in the house. Well, every single person in the house is going to get it. And then they're underserved in terms of you know, medical care. They pick up the phone and they say, well, who to call? Grandmother has the illness, she's getting sick. And our entire medical community in Dallas that was affiliated with the hospitals, they just said, well, sorry, we can't help you. COVID is not a treatable disease in the outpatient setting. So there's no sense in even coming to the clinic. So now you've, in effect, abandoned an entire multi-generational household. You've locked them all up with these stay-at-home orders. Now they're all going to get sick, and they have no access to any doctors who are willing to treat them. So the whole thing is just a perfect setup for a disaster. Um, and we go into all of, all of this and our book. Now, if you want to speak about um, specifically, you know, physical health factors, I would say that the entire country, the entire American people, um, not any particular racial group, I mean, tends to be heavily weighted in the American South and in the Midwest. But I mean, all of us as an entire people should probably try and slim down and um, reach something, something at least close to our ideal weight. In the, in the case of COVID, what we saw happen was an acute viral infection, in effect, joined forces 
with an underlying public health epidemic, name, namely obesity. Obesity is a very, very highly weighted risk factor for serious COVID illness. So from a purely public health standpoint, we as an entire country, and I include myself, you know, we should all strive to slim down and quit eating so much sugar. Now, so let me let me ask this. Um, your your book or you all's book does it identify the follow the money? Well, that's always uh, a very useful investigative uh, principle is follow the money. Yes, um, we do a lot of money following in our book. And what we've discovered is that public health policy, particularly at the global level with respect to emerging disease pandemics, in many ways, the guys that are calling the shots on uh, this global public health policy are these international foundations. The two most important are the Rockefeller Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Both of these international foundations have hundreds of billions of dollars. They've formed very close alliances with heads of state, um, with the guys that run the national treasuries of nations all over the world. And in many respects, it's these public, these international, uh, pardon me, these international private foundations, they also work closely with another foundation called the, War, uh, the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, um, or they have their annual meeting in Davos, it is these institutions who in many ways have taken over the entire politics and business of pandemic response. And they have enormous financial and economic interests. Um, they formed very close alliances with the pharmaceutical industries, industry and with public treasuries to create a partnership agreement in which the primary focus, the primary business that they focus on is vaccine development. If you hang around with these guys, you know, they would say that the solution to all public health problems lies in vaccine development. And, and we, we now know two and a half years into this that the vaccine really hasn't been an effective solution at all. Um, so we follow the money and the money leads us to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Well, what, how, how was the, or uh, was the World Health Organization compromised in this process? Well, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, is the largest private donor to the World Health Organization. So um, Tedros, the, the head of the World Health Organization, I mean, he knows who's buttering his bread. And <clears throat> Bill Gates has presented himself, this isn't a theory, this is by his own assertions, um, he and his foundation are obsessively, I would say, relentlessly interested in vaccine development. So if you have a foundation that is investing hundreds of billions of dollars in new vaccine development, and it's also providing one of the main contributions to the budget of the World Health Organization, it should come as no surprise that the WHO's agenda very closely aligns with that of the Gates Foundation. So, does this, everything that we've talked about so far, 
it, it does it include the new variants or does that escalate the problem how does that fit in the mix well the the emergence of variants i mean this is this is a very complex area of investigation um i mean all of these RNA viruses, it could be rhinoviruses, it could be influenza viruses <clears throat> or coronaviruses. There are a number of them. They replicate very quickly and they make, it's called a coding error. When they start to replicate, you know, very, very fast, they don't always replicate in, 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 in perfect replication. There are, there are little mutations and variations um, that are constantly, these mutations are, are, are constantly causing the virus to, to, to change, to, to mutate. So um, ideally, the human immune system, if, if it's natural immunity, the human immune system is challenged by one of these viruses. You develop a broad spectrum immunity. It's, it's, it's different antibodies, it's T cells, it's, it's immunity that actually forms in the respiratory tract. There should be a fairly broad recognition that your own immune system is, a, so that your own immune system is able to also recognize these variants. Um, and it does seem that someone who has, got COVID and recovered from COVID, it doesn't really matter what the variant is, there's pretty good immune recognition of all of them. Now there were breakthrough infect infections of natural immunity with Omicron, but if you'd already had Alpha or Delta or some of these earlier variants, then Omicron would subsequently be an extremely mild infection. Um, now, you will recall that our public health authorities were very quick to dismiss natural immunity, which made no sense whatsoever. I mean, natural immunity, if you get an illness and recover from it, our understanding of every other illness in history has shown us or indicated to us that natural immunity, I mean, the human immune system evolved over God knows how many years. Um, it's, it's effective. If you get a disease and recover, then you have immunity to it. But what we were told is, no, natural immunity doesn't work, or it doesn't work as well as immunity that's induced by a vaccine. But we knew, anyone who knows anything about immunology knew that this can't be true. Um, the concern now is that because the vaccines that have been developed thus far are so narrow in targeting just a small sliver of the coronavirus that we're talking about, namely, it's the genetic code for the spike protein, the little spike on the outside, that, that inducement of immunity, that induction of immunity is so narrow that any time the virus mutates away from that original spike protein, then the person who's received vaccine immunity, no, the, the vaccine immunity is no longer sufficiently covering the new mutant. So what, the what, what, let, me, let me ask you this, on that point. Yeah. So the, the treatment regimen that Dr. McCullough was speaking of would that be considered uh, still applicable for the variants? Yes, yes. Because remember, the treatment, there, there, there are two components to this. There are actually three. So the first one is you have one element of the treatment, which is, we, we call it an antiviral, an antiviral agent. Um, hydroxychloroquine or um, azithromycin in combination or ivermectin. These are agents which seem to have some effect in blocking viral replication. They interfere with the enzymes in the virus 
that enable the virus to uh, invade the cell and to replicate. So you have the antiviral component. Then you have the anti-inflammatory component of early treatment. Now, interestingly enough, hydroxychloroquine it's very effective against rheumatoid arthritis. So it's also an anti-inflammatory, and we've long known that. So hydroxychloroquine seems to have a modest antiviral effect and an anti-inflammatory effect. Um, then when you start talking about thrombosis, about blood clotting in the lungs, extra strength aspirin, 325 milligrams, and Lovenox, it's a, a powerful blood thinner. These agents have an anti-thrombosis effect. So these are these drugs, which have been around for a long time, they, in effect, what they're doing is they're not only having blocking the virus, <clears throat> they're actually reducing the severity of symptoms within the ill person so that the ill person doesn't become extremely ill and have to be admitted to hospital. These basic principles of treatment apply to all of the variants. Okay. Now, we have a crime scene. Uh, we have a motive. I'm saying the money is the motive. Money and control. And control. Power. All right. Now, that, that, so that that's obviously means that we have victims. Is there going to be any litigation as it relates to class actions, this or that, uh, malpractice, this or that? Well, this is one of the most complex parts of the story. And, and I, you know, I think it's important for your audience to understand that what we call the biopharmaceutical complex, um, they started this complex of international foundations, pharmaceutical companies, government agencies, the NIH, the FDA, the CDC. And they started planning for pandemics all the way, you know, I'd say at least as early as 2003, when the first SARS came out of China. And then the year 2005, Congress passed the Cures Act. And the Cures Act specifically provides for how the government is going to respond to the next pandemic. And if you read the Cures Act, it provides in the event that the government agencies declare an emergency, the moment that emergency is declared pursuant to the Cures Act, there's enormous immunity. I would say blanket immunity mm. provided to the entire medical and pharmaceutical industries that respond to the emergency. You also have this statute emergency use authorization for medical products. If an emergency is declared, the government can say, well, we're going to, per the FDA guidelines, we're not going to provide full approval in which the drug company could advertise its drug as being safe and effective, but because it's an emergency, we'll grant it emergency use authorization. And under that provision, there's no, there's full immunity from liability in the event of injury caused by the product. So I would say the biopharmaceutical complex has done a great job of creating immunity for itself. So we, the citizens, we have to obey and comply with their orders, their mandates, their terrible policies. But if any of us is harmed by it, um, then they are immune from any accountability 
or civil or criminal liability. So um, it's kind of a rigged game, I would say. <laughs> and we, the people, uh, are, are got the short end of the stick is how I would characterize it. So no. we can't sue them. Uh, they control the public policy that deals with accountability, distribution, and research. Therefore, uh, we are at risk and we are in constant threat of any virus futuristically. They can shut it down to a narrow narrative as, as far as cutting people and research like Dr. McCullough out or uh, making, make, trying to say that uh, uh, what they call it, paint a negative picture on whatever he's going to say and his colleagues. And we just kind of stuck with that? Well, what I would like to see um, <clears throat> would be people who have a lot more power <clears throat> and resources than I do and that and, and the, are at the disposal of Dr. Remember, Dr. McCullough was fired from his institution. Many of his credentials were stripped from him. I oh mean, no, I didn't, I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. Oh yes. Um, so, um, what I would like to see um, is men and women with real power and real wealth stand up to defend the citizens and to defend our constitutional republic from these predators who do whatever they want, make hundreds of billions of dollars in the bargain, and bear no liability. <clears throat> I mean, I can write a book about it, and I can talk with you about it, and you have an audience, and your audience, I'm sure, consists of men and women who care about our country. But um, it seems to me when we start talking about practical solutions that you know, we need people that have some real resources, some real power and some real wealth to stand up and, and defend this, this constitutional republic. I mean, it's really all we have. Um, well, well let, me, let me ask this then. We, we have about six minutes left. Give us your strongest pitch for next steps for the general public. Well, I would like to see the general public um, stand up and, and support, for example, Senator Rand Paul um, from Kentucky. I mean, we could start by getting Senator Paul reelected. Um, Senator Ron Johnson from Wisconsin. Um, if you have any people listening in Wisconsin, they should reelect. These are guys who are in Washington and they've really, really fought hard for the truth. What about Texas? I'm not sure about Texas, quite frankly. Um, I mean, do in your estimate, do, do we have some good people standing for office in Texas? No. I'm not sure who to support in our state. Well, the, the evidence that's out there is questionable, very, very questionable, because the demonstration based on the, what has been done, it hasn't been done. Um, so, um, uh, you're an academic at an institution in Houston. Um, I mean, m maybe a man like you in a position like yours, I mean, start with your institution. I mean, are you collegial with the people that run your university? I mean, well, that depends on the, that depends on the politicians that influence that university. Right. So... Normally, with the politicians, it's like, well, we don't know about him, meaning me. So I right. would say it's it's moment by moment, moment to moment. I mean, I think every human society, you know, has to a large degree been governed by um, who, I'm sorry to say this, it sounds so oversimplified, but you know, who is doing the financing? I mean, who finances the political campaigns? Who 
um, who is paying, uh, you know, who's running the big companies in the community. I mean, it's, it's the money guys who tend to have the real power. And um, I mean, I'm sorry to, to be sort of defeatist, but I, you know, and, and, and tell the, the wealthy class and I'm talking about Silicon Valley, the, the billionaires of Silicon Valley. Um, you know, Elon Musk moved to Texas. He seems to be someone who's interested in our defending our constitutional republic. But more guys like Elon Musk, and Elon Musk might actually step up his game a bit. I mean, he might even get a little more aggressive in defending our republic and our citizenry. And Wall Street. But the problem with Silicon Valley and Wall Street, and I'm kind of picking on them because they're very, very powerful segments of our economy and our polity. Until those guys get more serious about defending the U.S. Constitutional Republic, I, I, I think that we're all in, in grave danger. Well, now, if my next step is to talk to and reach out to Elon Musk. Can I tell him you recommended him? He, he probably will have no idea who I am. <laughs> uh, but, um, tell him that Dr. McCullough, because I'm, I'm representing Dr. McCullough in this interview, tell him Dr. McCullough, um, who's testified before the U.S. Senate on multiple occasions, testified before the Texas State Senate, is probably the world's foremost expert in uh, COVID-19 pandemic response. Tell him that Dr. Peter McCullough recommended that you speak to him. Okay, and, and I will do that. And Dr. McCullough has 650 peer review papers on the subject. Uh, is more than anybody else on the planet. And we really want to thank you for stepping in and stepping up for him. Uh, today on this interview, but we will be in touch uh, maybe in uh, November, December, or January to kind of do a follow-up. So I'll let you know what uh, the response, if we get a response from Elon Musk. We want to say thank you to Mr. What's the name of the book? The uh, Courage. The Courage to Face COVID-19, Preventing Hospitalization and Death While Battling the Biopharmaceutical Complex. Your listeners can go to our website, couragetofacecovid.com. And this book is, is using a, uh, an investigative, crime investigative uh, format. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so we know we have victims, we have criminals, perpetrators, predators. It's, it makes for good reading. Now, we're going to sign off. We want to thank you for coming, Mr. John Leake from Dallas, Texas, co-author of the book, The Courage to Face uh, COVID-19. This is Charles X. White, your host, Community Views and Solutions, signing off. Until next time, this has been one segment of scholars, scientists, and practitioners. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Charles. I enjoyed the talk very much. Thank All you. All right.